A few months ago, I talked about the Zoom, which was Microsoft's attempt at creating an iPod competitor. Now, you should check out that video if you haven't seen Brown Zoom in all of its glory yet, but in short, it, well, failed. M massively. <laughs> Microsoft ended up losing over $1 billion on the Zoom project. But the good thing is, they learned their lesson, they stuck to their strengths, and they never made another mistake ever again. Right? Right? This is the 2010 Microsoft Kin smartphone. Another failed $1 billion project from our friend Stevie Boy. It has a 2.6 inch TFT touchscreen display and Nvidia tech. Hold up, before we talk about what Kin, we gotta talk about how and why Kin. The year is 2008 and Microsoft's Jay Allard, a well-known executive, has had a lot of successes. He's largely credited for basically bringing Microsoft into the internet age, uh, convincing Bill Gates to put TCP IP support in Windows 95. He also co-founded the Xbox project, focusing on the Xbox software platform, Xbox Live, and recruiting developers to publish for Xbox. <sighs> I mean, the guy was a bit of a phenom, at least until Zoom. Allard co-led the Zoom project, but on the product side, with other Microsoft executive Brian Lee handling the business side. And as we discussed previously, the Zoom itself wasn't terrible. The hardware, in many instances, was actually better than Apple's iPod offerings. Where Zoom failed was marketing and market timing, and that wasn't really Jay Allard's fault. So when he proposed a mysterious new mobile phone initiative to Microsoft executives, they were on board. It was called Project Pink. In order to kickstart development of Project Pink, Microsoft spent a rumored $500 million to acquire Danger Incorporated, the company that built the popular T-Mobile sidekick that was all the rage amongst teens in an era when younger kids could neither afford nor make use of a more business-focused smartphone, like a BlackBerry, Palm Trio, or one of Microsoft's own Windows Mobile smartphones. Anyone remember the, uh, the sidekick? My cousin had one and I was very jealous. And then I got the Razer and then I felt cooler. Microsoft needed Danger's cloud computing expertise and intellectual property more than they really needed the talent there. And so several layoffs uh, came with near immediacy upon acquisition. But a few of the remaining Danger employees and veteran Microsoft staff came together to begin development on this rumored Project Pink. And they did so inside of their PMX, Premium Mobile Experiences division at Microsoft. Kind of a cool name. The original intent for Project Pink was for the device to be a powerful feature phone focused on social media and instant messaging similar to the sidekick that had been popular amongst teens, but with cool aggregated social feeds for a number of networks like Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, and more with one touch sharing features. In a vacuum, it sounded like a good idea. And Engadget reported that handset manufacturers and network carriers had initially been very enthusiastic and excited about the project with multiple companies offering to partner with Microsoft. Eventually, Verizon Wireless was chosen as the launch carrier with Sharp to build the actual handsets. But look, I mean, I wouldn't be making this video without some saucy drama, right? And the saucy drama there was. You see, Project Pink wasn't, of course, the only mobile operating system that Microsoft had been working on at the time. In early 2008, uh, the Windows Mobile division, led by executive Andy Lees, had been pretty successful. Now look, the OS wasn't as new and flashy as the six month old iPhone, and it trailed behind Symbian and Blackberry, which were the market leaders, but it still had respectable market share, especially in the business world. And that's what Microsoft viewed to be its core market. Now, Mallard was a bit of a visionary, allegedly, and rather than focusing on kind of semantics, he was more focused on features and big ideas. Nobody's really sure if he had intended for Project Pink to ship with the operating system that Danger had shipped, which was a legacy Java-based platform. But what they did know was that he wanted to add new bits and pieces, as well as what he thought to be, at the time, Microsoft's greatest strengths, like the Zoom software. And, you know, I think he's a little biased there because he made the Zoom software. But he wanted to add things like that to the phone without having to shift the entire project to Windows Mobile. Shifting to Windows Mobile would have delayed the release significantly, but 
It's also because there seemed to be a bit of a kerfuffle between Allard and Lees. Especially because according to Engadget, Lees quickly became a phenom inside of Microsoft and people were excited to work on Project Pink. He started sucking a lot of the development resources and attention away from the Windows Mobile project and away from Andy Lees, which allegedly Lees did not like. We'll probably never know for sure, but an allegedly jealous Lees was able to convince the higher-ups and the Microsoft board that he should be in charge of Project Pink. They agreed, and it ultimately caused Allard to be pushed into the background until his ultimate departure from Microsoft. So what did Andy Lees do with Project Pink? Well, it's reported that... not much. By late 2008, it was pretty apparent that the iPhone had not been the joke that Microsoft had thought it would be. $500? Apple nailed a lot of the features that they had originally mocked, like stylus-less touch input, the lack of a hardware keyboard, a desktop class web browser, and more. And just as with Google's Android project, remember this goofy thing? The iPhone totally changed the course of development for Microsoft, and the new Windows Phone 7 OS was Microsoft's new opportunity to dethrone Symbian and BlackBerry once and for all and start competing head-on with Apple and Google in this next-generation mobile race. So at this point, Project Pink to him had become more of an annoyance than anything, something that Lee's was contractually obligated to deliver to the launch partner Verizon Wireless, but really nothing more than that. Jay Allard's vision was scrapped, most of the features were thinned out, and the phone's OS was shifted to the ancient Windows CE, which resulted, <laughs> a bit hilariously, in a number of delays until the device was officially unveiled way after it was supposed to in April of 2010, unveiled at a nightclub event in San Francisco. And Microsoft, well, they unveiled this, the Kin. This is the Kin 1, a tiny little clamshell device that gives me slight Palm pre-vibes, though it feels significantly cheaper than the Palm ever did. And the keyboard, which is absolutely abysmal, is actually pretty handsome. Even though the build quality is lackluster, and it truly is, the sliding screen hinge still feels pretty good all these years later. And frankly, I mean, for all its issues, it does look just, well, downright fun. It was even codenamed Turtle during its development, and I can kind of see why. <laughs> it has a 2.6 inch TFT 240p display, a capacitive plastic touchscreen, a 5 megapixel camera that shoots, well, disappointing photos and videos, even for the era. It had 4 gigs of storage, 256 gigs of RAM, <laughs> scratch that, 256 megabytes of RAM, and an NVIDIA Tegra SoC clocked at 600 megahertz. Now, Microsoft also offered a more expensive Kin 2. Not the second generation, but there were two devices released simultaneously. Kin 1, Kin 2. Kin 2 came with a larger 3.4 inch display, a horizontally sliding keyboard instead of vertical, had an eight megapixel camera and a flash, as well as double the storage, eight gigs, though neither phone had expandable SD card memory. Kind of a strange omission for the time. Now, the hardware, doesn't sound all that remarkable because, well, it, it isn't, and it wasn't. Remember, this was intended to be a fairly budget-conscious device. Where Kin excelled, and sadly, where it also failed, was its software, which is gonna be, unfortunately, pretty tricky for me to demonstrate because Verizon and Microsoft absolutely murdered these phones. They released a firmware update that basically removed every feature that made the Kin great. And I'll get to that whole disaster in a minute. But I do want to highlight some of the Kin's original features because not all of them were terrible. In fact, some of them were pretty cool, like the loop. The loop, as it was called, was the first thing you'd see when unlocking your device. And it was basically an aggregated feed from all of your logged in social media networks, including Facebook, Twitter, Windows Live, which was apparently a social network, I don't know, MySpace and other web news feeds. And despite some issues like only being able to update every 15 minutes automatically or when manually refreshed, a problem that Microsoft blamed on poor battery life and social network APIs at the time, it generally did a pretty good job at summarizing a bunch of different networks in one place. Something that frankly, I would like to have today. When you were ready to share something with your friends, you could basically drag any content into a persistent dot on the screen called the spot. 
You could drag photos, websites, text messages, status updates, and more, basically anything you could think of. And once pulled into the spot, you could then begin adding friends. Uh, you'd open your contact list, drag your friends into the spot as well, and then once finished, you could touch the spot. It would show you what content you're intending to share and with whom, and you could decide the method by which you would share it, and it would do it. Pretty cool. Most impressively, however, was Kin Studio, a cloud storage service that automatically synced everything from your Kin device, including photos, videos, messages, and contacts. They could be accessed from a computer or web browser and also restored to a replacement Kin device. Now, this seems obvious now, but in 2010, neither Google nor Apple had come up with a similar solution. iCloud didn't launch till almost a year and a half later in late 2011. And Google Plus, remember that? Didn't really offer the same features until 2012. The phone also featured full Zune software that had near parity with their portable MP3 players. Software that I'd argue was much more fully fleshed out than the iPod Touch or iPhone's music app of the time. I mean, there was FM radio support, video playback support, and most importantly, Zune Pass support, which allowed for streaming and syncing music on the go directly from the device, subscription style. This was way before Spotify had gained any popularity in the United States. A lot of these were good ideas, and Microsoft's plan to target teens with a low-cost, social-focused device really didn't seem like a horrible idea. So then, what happened? Well, a lot of stuff. Kin was clearly rushed out the door, and there were a number of vitally important features that just were absent when the device launched. There was no App Store. Heck, there weren't even preloaded games on the device. The web browser was reportedly unusable, with insanely long page load times and frequent lockups. Importing contacts from your old phone, I love this one, had to be done at a Verizon store with the help of a Verizon employee, and only if your prior phone was a Verizon phone. Contacts import via SIM card, Bluetooth, V card, and USB cable syncing didn't exist. Yikes. Kin also didn't have a calendar app ready to go, which meant no event seeking via Outlook or Google Calendar. A weird omission for a device focused on social events. Also missing was a calculator app, because while teens don't need that worthless math crap, Kin was also unable to instant message or use any IM client. This is especially weird, considering that the T-Mobile sidekick, Kin's predecessor, was famously very good at IM. It was discovered inside the Kin's firmware eventually that the foundation for AIM, Windows Live, and Yahoo Messenger were all present, and one could speculate that it had been intended for a future software release, but sadly, for one that would never come. But despite all these issues, that's not why the Kin failed, at least not in my opinion. One major issue was marketing. Microsoft wasn't, well, they weren't cool, and several of their how-do-you-do fellow kids ad campaigns, they just fell on deaf ears. Except for the one that raised a public hellstorm when a young man sent an upshirt picture taken with a kin to a girl, which many criticized as inappropriate sexualization of a minor, normalization of sexting, and plausible case for unwanted sexual advances or harassment. Yikes, Microsoft marketing. Another major issue was the device's launch on Verizon Wireless itself. Microsoft had originally intended for the device to have a free or extremely inexpensive data plan, one that parents might reasonably justify paying for. However, upon launch, things changed. In order to use any of the social features, basically the entire premise of Kin, you had to pay Verizon Wireless $29.99 per month, which was the same price as a 3G unlimited data plan for full-blown smartphones. But that's just data. You'd also need a voice and SMS plan that was another $40 per month to begin with. So you were looking at $70 plus after paying $50 or $100 for the handset itself, all while signing a two-year contract with extortionary early termination fees. By comparison, Verizon, who had yet to become a carrier for the iPhone, was offering the HTC Droid Incredible at just $100 more than Kin 2, with the same monthly data costs. Though, it was actually a smartphone. <laughs> and that's the real reason, in my opinion, why the Kin failed. Timing. What started as a project in late 2007, mere months after the extraordinarily expensive $600 on-contract iPhone had launched with 2G and limited features like the absence of MMS and being able to shoot video and more, 
it wasn't a threat. It was too early. Smartphones weren't there yet. And Kin, if done well, could have accessed an enormous market of youth. However, because of incompetence and mismanagement and toxic corporate culture, the project was pushed back years. And when it finally released, it was a joke. Android and iPhone were already clearly the future and entering the third year of production, which meant that many kids were starting to get their parents' old smartphone hand-me-downs as they elected to upgrade themselves. The idea that someone hip enough to want their status updated at all time, but didn't want the capabilities of a smartphone were just wrong. They didn't exist and Microsoft lost. Analyst Rob Enderly had the following to say, the Kin one was a mistake from day one. The extra time they took to convert the Kin from the Sidekick platform to Windows CE made it about a year and a half late to market. And the merger likely added another year to year and a half. That's 1.5 to three years late, depending on when you start the clock. So what happens next? Well, it's rumored that Microsoft and Verizon both had extraordinary amounts of unsold inventory, with estimates that fewer than 10,000 units actually ever sold to customers. Yikes. Verizon knew that the phone was doomed to fail, and they pulled the plug on Kin less than two months after its release. In an attempt to sell the unsold remaining inventory in a last ditch effort, Microsoft quickly worked with Verizon to launch Kin 1M and Kin 2M in October of 2010. The hardware was unchanged, likely, in fact, the same units, but a splash of paint was added to distinguish it from the original models. And it came with a firmware update that was really more like a firmware replacement. Gone was the loop and the spot and Kin Studio and well, everything. What little character and good ideas ha Kin had from launch had completely vanished. Microsoft replaced the entire UI with a bunch of tiles not dissimilar from their recent Windows 7 release. They added a missing calculator app, ooh, thanks guys, and a calendar app, though it still had no syncing support. These Kin M phones had few abilities beyond text messaging, phone calls, and uh, doing some math. The Zune app stayed, but Zune Pass became far less desirable without the ability to stream and download songs on the go. These changes were made for one reason. The phones no longer required an expensive data plan. And they also dropped the device pricing by $50. So the 1M became free and the 2M became $50 on a two-year contract. Now, an undisclosed number of these eventually sold, but the Kin wasn't special anymore. It was just a phone. More frustratingly, Microsoft quickly pulled the plug on most of the API services and cloud support for Kin, which completely broke usability of the original phones. It became worthless. So to remedy this, Microsoft pushed an update to the original Kin series to match the feature set found in the less sophisticated M successors, which is what the original owner of my Kin did. It's a dumb phone now. Luckily, Verizon did allow a free trade-in to a 3G smartphone for all affected first-gen Kin owners. Originally intended to become a revolutionary Zune successor social-focused smartphone, Kin failed, as did Microsoft's other early 2010s mobile attempt, Windows Phone. I lived with Windows Phone as my primary device for a week a couple years ago, and you should definitely check out that video if you haven't seen it already. So, what do you think about the Kin? Did you own one? Had you heard of one? Did you even know they existed? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, that other button seems to work okay too. Thank you so much for watching, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.